Chapter 4 <laughs> Malice Darkblade reclined in a carved chair of black ashwood, a leg thrown over one of the chair's curving arms, and studied the twitching, pulpy shape hanging from hooks in the centre of the small room. Each convulsion set the iron chains softly clinking, a soothing sound after the heated exertions of the previous hours. Sensing their master's urges were spent, the half-dozen slaves slipped quietly into the shadows around the perimeter of the room and stood a respectful distance from their lord. <sighs> Bathe him in anguins and stitch him shut. Then feed him wine and hushalta and return him to his quarters, Malice said, his voice hoarse from shouting. The weakness and fugue he'd felt after the Drakau's ordeal was gone, replaced by a dark, oily calm. In the past, the horrors of the ordeal always faded swiftly, arising only later in nightmares or moments of great passion. This time had been different somehow. He had outdone himself with Furlan. Such an exquisite tapestry of pain, such horror, such darkness. He'd learned many things, gained many important insights that he'd never known before. And Furlan had too. Malice could see it in his eyes. Whether the glimpse into the abyss had provided wisdom or madness, only time would tell. But that mattered little to him. He'd learned all he needed to know. That and much more besides. Footsteps echoed across the floor behind him. A tall druki wearing a polished steel breastplate and greaves stepped to Malice's side. He was a young man, handsome and unscarred, wearing the hadrilkar of Malice's house. His eyes were troubled as he considered the artful ruin of Furlan's body. That was unwise, he said, offering Malice a goblet of steaming wine. Malice accepted the goblet gratefully. His hands and arms were painted crimson up to the elbows, and streaks of gore glistened against the hard muscles of his bare chest. <sighs> I was careful, Selah. He'll live, more or less. He smiled darkly around a mouthful of wine. Nothing in the treaty says I can't be <laughs> entertained by my guests from time to time. He isn't your guest, Malice. Furlan belongs to the Drakau, who wants the feud with Nagor ended. Trifling with that is dangerous, especially now. Malice gave Silar a sharp look. Most retainers would never dare speak so frankly to their master. It was a good way to wind up hanging from a set of chains like Furlan. Or worse. But Silar Thornblood was a druki of considerable skills and bafflingly little ambition. And so, Malice offered him a little more latitude than most. Why are you in your armour? We caught an assassin in the tower while you were at court. The highborn's eyes narrowed. Where? In your quarters. Silar shifted uncomfortably, glancing at the floor. We still don't know how he got in. The precautions your half-sister placed on your bedchamber warned us of his presence, but he still managed to kill two men before we could corner him. You took him alive? Now Silar looked even more uncomfortable. Uh, no, my lord. He hurled himself into the bedchamber's fireplace when we pressed him hard. Uh, naturally, I take full responsibility. Malice waved his hand dismissively. <sighs> He's dead. I'm not. It sounds as though he was exceptionally skilled. Silar caught his master's eye, reading the implication in the highborn's words. He was from the temple. I'm certain of it. There were no deadlier assassins in Nagaroth than the acolytes of the Temple of Cain, 
Malice took a thoughtful sip of wine. My former backers have deeper connections and purses than I imagined. Unless... Unless... Malice pursed his lips, considering. Furlan, much to my surprise, turned out to have quite a few interesting things to say. Some of it might even be true. And if so... All at once, the vague notion of a plan began to take shape in his mind. Do I dare? Then, there was an assassin from the temple in my quarters. What have I to lose at this point? To hesitate is to die. The highborn drained the goblet in great, thirsty gulps and sprang from the chair. Get me two guards, he commanded, handing the cup back to Silar. I'm going to see the Gyra. Silar's eyes widened as Malice swept purposefully across the room, already belting his robe in place. Don't you wish to clean yourself up a bit first? The retainer asked. Malice laughed coldly. <laughs> Conspiracies thrive in spilt blood, Scylla. It tends to focus one's mind on the business at hand. The city of Hag Grave lay at the bottom of a narrow valley, like an oglier crouched over its prey. Its broad streets, conductive for the heavy industry that was the city's main source of wealth, radiated out from the huge plaza of conquest that lay at the foot of the Drakar's fortress. The fortress, a mighty collection of spires, courtyards and deadly cul-de-sacs, bound by an inner and outer perimeter of high walls, contained not only the households of several high-ranking Druki lords and ladies, but also the city's convent of witches and the cold one stables of the city guard. The apartments of the Volcar and his children occupied an entire set of spires on the eastern quarter of the huge castle, overlooking the three mountain entrances of the East Foundry and the broad avenue of crushed cinders leading north to the caverns of the underworld. Many of the towers belonging to Lurhan's children were connected by narrow bridges, allowing the highborn to come and go without troubling themselves with a long descent to the public levels of the castle and then back up again. Such was the theory. In practice, the children of the Volcar saw the bridges as an invitation to murder and avoided them scrupulously. Except for tonight, Malice moved swiftly along the delicate-looking stone bridge connecting his spire with Nagaira's, his cloak billowing like a spread of ebon wings in the gusting wind. The auroras sweeping from the chaos wastelands in the far north had subsided, leaving tattered clouds scudding fast across the face of a single moon. Arleth Van moved several yards ahead of him, Lunara several yards behind. Lunara held a crossbow ready and scanned the nearest overlooking spires, while Arleth Van tested his footing on the bridge with each heavy tread. It took ten long minutes for the three Druki to work their way across the vaulting reach. At the far end there was the recessed door, lit from above by a flickering globe of witchlight. Arleth Van paused, and Malice was surprised to find a sentry waiting for them sheltered in the doorway's small niche. He was one of Nagaira's pet rogues, and watched the trio with hooded eyes as he played at cleaning his fingernails with a wicked-looking stiletto. If you've murder in mind, Red Hand, you'll find no welcome here, 
the rogue drawled in a sly grin. Yet there was nothing frivolous about the set of his shoulders, or the careful precise movements of his knife. If I'd meant you murder, Dalva, I'd have had Lenara put your eye out from back at the other end of the span, Malice hissed. Now get that door open, you halfpenny thug. I've a mind to speak to my beloved sister before I freeze to death. Beloved half-sister, Dalvar corrected, pointing with his knife for emphasis. And it's not within my power, bloody fingers or no. You'll wait here on my mistress's pleasure. Suppose I have Arleth Van cut you into pieces and we feed you to the Nighthawks! Hmm. It won't get the door open any faster. <coughs> no, but it'll be a pleasant diversion in the meantime. About as pleasant as a knife in the eye, I expect. Both sides grudgingly conceded the other's point, and then settled down to wait. Nagaira kept Malice out on the bridge long enough for the cold to have settled deep into his bones. It was an effort of will to keep his teeth from chattering or his limbs from shivering. Dalvar continued to work on his nails, seemingly oblivious to the conditions. Finally, there was a dull thud of bolts being drawn back, and the door opened a finger's width. Dalvar leaned back and shared a few whispered words with whoever was on the other side, then bowed deeply to Malice. The stiletto had magically disappeared. My mistress will see you now, Dreadlord, he said with a grin. Pray accompany me, but leave any thought of ill intent at the threshold. Against Nagaira or you? For there are spirits within these walls. Who would take such things amiss? Delvar finished, his eyes dancing with black mirth. The retainer led the trio inside, past a bowing servant and down a short passage into a small guard chamber. Four guards in full armour sat at a small circular table, eating a late meal of bread and pickled eels, and eyeing malice with casual menace. Globes of witchfire flickered from sconces on the walls, and racks of spears and crossbows sat ready to repel an assault from the bridge or the levels below. A flight of stairs curved both upwards and downwards along the curving outer wall of the room, and a stout oak door stood in the wall opposite the passage. Malice knew the way as well as, or better than, Dalvar, the highborn pushed past the retainer, who offered a token protest, then turned right and leapt lightly up the tower's curving stair. Up and up he climbed, and with each step he felt the light touch of invisible forces caressing his face and lingering along his gore-stained hands. They flowed in and out of him on the tide of his breath, touching his heart with icy fingers. He'd made light of Dalvar's warnings, but he knew all too well that it was no idle boast. Nagaira did not suffer uninvited guests lightly. The stairs finally ended at a small dark landing. Icy wind whistled through a number of arrow slits, set into the thick stone walls. Two retainers in glittering mail and thick robes glistening with frost stood to either side of a pair of tall oak doors. They regarded him coldly, from behind, golden kedlin, worked in the shape of snarling manticore faces. Their gauntleted hands rested easily on the pommels of unsheathed greatswords, but they made no move to hinder malice as he pushed the double doors wide and rushed into Nagaira's sanctum like a rising wind. It was the law of the Witch King that magic was forbidden to the Druki, save for a select group of women who dedicated their lives to him and spent their days in convents in the cities and citadels across Nagaroth. The Dark Brides of Malekith, or the Hags as they were commonly known, served their local overlord as needed but ultimately, they answered to none other than the Witch King himself. 
Any other Juruki, especially a male, who was caught pursuing the dark arts was bound in red-hot chains and delivered to the Witch King's fortress at Nagarond, and was never seen again. Naturally, there were exceptions. Minor hedge sorcerers, practitioners of curses, and the secretive shadecasters, all of whom took the coin of the lowborn in exchange for their meagre services. The priestesses and blood witches of the Temple of Cain and the aerophants of the Temple of Slanesh kept sorceress traditions that were old when lost Nagareth was young, rites that not even Malekith dared trifle with. And then there was Balneth Bale, the self-styled Witch King of Nagore, who had encouraged the studies of his sister Eldire and kept them secret in hopes of profiting from them himself. Instead, he'd received a bloody rebuke by Malekith in the form of Volkar Lurhan and the army of Hagraith, who defeated Nagor's army and made Bale and his people a vassal city to the Hag. By the same token, it was an open secret that Nagaira, the second daughter of the fearsome Lurhan, was a scholar of the Dark Paths. Not necessarily a practitioner, but someone who studied the ancient ways of the arcane lore for her own personal ends. No one had ever seen her cast a spell or bind a spirit to her will, nor had anyone ever successfully claimed to have been a victim of her enchantments. Thus, she kept herself poised on the razor's edge, dabbling in forbidden knowledge that lent her power and influence without allowing it to be her undoing. That said, Malus suspected that Nagaira's sanctum contained the sorts of arcane tomes, debased scrolls, potions, idols and artefacts that any sorcerer would sell the remainder of his tattered soul to possess. It was also, the Highborn noted, thankfully warm. A small circular hearth rose in the centre of the room, giving off hissing flames of green and blue that turned the curved walls into a swirling chiaroscuro of dancing, threatening shadows. A sinuous, scaly creature with tightly furled leather wings darted into the shadows at his sudden entrance and hissed threateningly from behind an overflowing bookshelf. As far as Malice knew, he was the only member of the family Nagaira had ever permitted to enter the room. His half-sister looked up from a low divan set near the fire. A short table had been pulled up to the divan. Sitting atop it was a huge dust-covered book propped on a small lectern and a curious tripod of copper wire supporting half of a human head. The head had been sheared cleanly through just below the nose and the grisly trophy rested in the tripod with the open brain pan pointing towards the ceiling. Nagaira had pulled back the left sleeve of her woolen robe, exposing her sleek, pale forearm which was covered in an intricate tattoo of tightly woven loops and spirals, stretching from her fingertips to her elbow. As Malice watched, she took a fine, brass-handled brush and dipped it carefully in the gaping brain pan. She shot a glance at Malice. He wasn't sure if it was a trick of the shifting light, but her eyes appear to be a vivid pale blue. Nagaira looked pointedly at her brother's hands. Are those your ideas of tattoos? She asked, using the brush to touch up on one of the lines on her arm. If so, I think my brushwork is much better than yours. I grew cold waiting on the bridge outside so I warmed my hands around Dalvar's beating heart. Malice snarled. Liar, she said with a sly grin. That man's blood runs colder than the Sea of Chill. Why else would I take him into my household? Finished, she licked the tip of the brush with a dainty pink tongue and set the instrument in a felt-lined box. She reclined gracefully on the divan, ostentatiously admiring her work. I'm very displeased with you, Malice. 
she said lightly. Running off with your little raid without warning me. While you were gone, that worm Uriel tried to practice his charms on me, as though that would make Yasmir jealous. I had to fend off his disgusting advances for months on end. At the mention of her brother's name, Nagaira's face darkened. The lines on her arms seemed to sharpen, then shift like coiling snakes. Malice found he couldn't take his eyes off them. Even though the sight set his heart to hammering and sent cold spasms through his guts. I... I I'm certain you disappointed him at every turn. He stammered then grit his teeth against the show of weakness. I told him I was saving my heart for another, she said, her voice smooth and cold as polished steel. <laughs> it made him very angry, I think. He seems to think he's entitled to solve his frustrations with me, the twisted little creature. Nagaira lowered her arm and glared at Malice. You could at least have the decency to sound jealous. With an effort, Malice crossed the room and settled on the divan next to her. I had to sneak away, dear sister. You and Bruglia and the rest left me no choice. Surely you didn't expect me to sit in my tower and wait for some noble to put his knife in me? Nagaira sighed. It's the law of the wolves, Malice. The biggest wolf cub gets the most milk. And so on down the line. Bruglia gets the biggest share. And the rest of us have to fight for what's left. I get barely enough wealth to survive on. And naturally, I make sure Uriel gets as little of the cut as possible. She shrugged, but her cold eyes were intent. Unfortunately, the temple takes care of their own, even the forsaken ones like him. If you are to blame anyone, blame him for taking your rightful share. Malice considered his sister for a moment, contemplating his next move. Beneath her diffident facade, he could sense an insatiable curiosity. What he didn't know was how still and deep her malice towards him ran. If she were truly displeased about his absence, there was every possibility he wasn't getting out of her sanctum alive. As it happens, he said, I have more than just my pathetic allotment of gold to hold against dear twisted Uriel. Oh, Nagaira said, arching one slender eyebrow. Her eyes had darkened to a stormy grey. Faint lines and spirals coiled in their depths. Do you know Furlan? The hostage from Nagor? A craven little sack of skin with an exaggerated sense of his own worth. I hear that's a common failing in Nagarites, you know. A weakness in the blood, perhaps. She said, her smile full of sweet poison. Malice ignored the jibe. Furlan and I had a long, energetic conversation this evening, he said. He'd been entertaining the delusion of making an alliance with me. An alliance? Against whom? Does it matter? He was most eager, though. He sent a letter by special messenger to meet me when I got off the boat at Clark Harand. Nagaida frowned. Clark around? But how? How did he know I hadn't disembarked at the slave tower? How else? No rider could have made the journey from Karen Car faster than my ship. So that leaves... Sorcery, she said. Just so, Malice answered. That same sorceress knowledge enabled someone to arrange a cunning little ambush for me on the slaver's road. He leaned close to Nagaira, his voice dripping to a silken whisper. And now I hear that my beloved sister has been using my name 
to spite the one magic wielder in Haggrave who isn't locked up in the local convent. His hand shot out, closing around Nagaira's pale throat. So now I am the one who is most displeased. Nagaira's breath caught in her throat at the touch of a sticky, clammy grip. But then she smiled and began to laugh. The sound was rich and smoky, mocking and seductive. Clever, clever little brother, she breathed. But why would Uriel the Forsaken entertain the likes of Furlan? The little toad groveled to get an audience, no doubt, Mala said. Just as he groveled before each of you in turn. I'm sure Uriel agreed to see him to find if he'd learned anything of interest about you or the others. The highborn tightened his grip minutely, feeling the hot pulse of blood in his half-sister's throat. Furlan, it seems, was given to believe that Uriel possessed a magical relic of some kind, supposedly a source of terrible power. A relic? Where would Furlan hear such a thing? Malice pulled Nagaira close, his thin lips mere inches from her own. Why, from you, sweet sister... I didn't believe it for myself at first, but Furlan went to great pains to convince me. For a moment, she was silent. Her breath was warm and fragrant against his skin. Then she smiled. I confess, I hoped Uriel would eat the little hostage's heart, and then even the temple couldn't protect him. The Drakau would have had him unraveled one nerve at a time, and I would have savoured every moment. She frowned. Sadly, it appears that the Forsaken is repulsive, but not a fool. Oh, indeed. Malice let his lips brush her cheek, her breath caught in her throat, and for an instant his mind was full of worms, writhing, spiralling shapes of darkness that wove in and out of his brain, leaving long tunnels that filled with inky shadows in their wake. He shuddered and leaned back against the divan, his hand jerking back from her, as though stung. Nagaira regarded him with depthless black eyes. Is it true then? Malice asked. Does Uriel have such a relic? Nagaira smiled. She too leaned back, increasing the distance between them. She tapped a tattooed finger, thoughtfully, against her lower lip. So I have been led to believe, she said. My spies tell me that Uriel has been seeking it for some time now, and acquired it recently at great expense after numerous failed expeditions. Why do you ask? Malice took a deep breath. Because I find myself wanting in power, and surrounded by enemies. If the relic is useful to him, why not me? Uriel is a sorcerer, Malice. You are not. Great power finds a way to make itself felt, sister. Sorcerer or no, I can bend it to my will. Nagaira laughed and it seemed the shadows on the wall danced in time to the sound. <sighs> you are a fool, Malice Darkblade, she said at last. But I confess that fools sometimes succeed where other mortals fail. So what of this relic? It is not, in fact, a source of power. At least, not in any sense you would understand. It is a key that... Legend has it, will open an ancient temple hidden deep within the chaos wastes. The power you want for lies within that temple. What is it? Nagaira shook her head. No one knows for certain. It was locked away in the days when Malekith fought alongside foul Anarian in the first war against chaos. She said. 
many thousands upon thousands of years ago. It's possible that the temple no longer even exists, or lies at the bottom of a boiling acid sea. Something in malice quickened like a spark on dry tinder. But if the temple and its treasures were beyond reach, the magic of the key would be affected, would it not? The Druki woman smiled approvingly. <laughs> Indeed. You are more canny than I thought, brother dear. So the temple and its treasure still lie within my reach, Malice said. It could lie within my reach. If I had a way to steal the key from Uriel and seek the place out myself. You wish to pit yourself against the Forsaken One in his lair. Your foolishness borders on the suicidal. Uriel doesn't spend his every waking hour in his tower. In fact, the temple has rights of its own to observe in the wake of the Hanalkar. He will be in the city every night for the next few nights, will he not? True, Nagaira agreed. But that leaves his servants, his guards, and most importantly, his web of protective wards and traps. Malice leaned forward and rested his fingertip lightly in the hollows of her throat. I'm sure you have ways of getting past his many enchantments. Nagaira chuckled. <laughs> and why would I help you? To hurt Uriel, of course, and to share in the power once I've brought it out of the wastes. She smiled. Of course. Now can you get me and a small group of my retainers into the tower? Nagaira's eyes roamed in crowded bookshelves and tables around the room, as if taking a mental inventory. I can get a small group inside the tower, she said, after a moment's thought, but I will have to accompany you as well. I expect some traps will require more than a protective amulet to slip past. Malice thought it over. He didn't like the idea, but he didn't see that he had any choice. At least with her along, he could be certain she would do everything in her power to ensure they got out alive. Very well. And we share in whatever power you bring out of the wastes? Of course, he said, the lie sliding smoothly off his tongue. His half-sister smiled, reclining languidly on the divan. Then linger with me here a while, dear brother, she said. It's been so long since we've seen one another, and you and I have much to 